Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and welcome to this edition of Revealing Prophecy. Each week we connect the dots of the news from around the world with biblical prophecy and talk about what was, what is, and what is to come. The monologue is our original work, and all other articles are used giving credit to their respective sources. Visit ignitinganation.com for a full roster of live daily, daily interviews, and check out the Biblical Truth Library containing almost 1,000 hours of rich Bible teachings. We encourage you to subscribe to the Igniting Nation YouTube channel where you'll find over 1,400 interviews from our daily live broadcast. Here's a quick look at what we will be covering on today's show. I'll be opening with a monologue, followed by a story by Dr. Michael Brown, Four Shocks of Revelation, One Day Everything Will Be Shaken, followed by a story by Trey Goins, Goins Phillips, Coronavirus, The Good News. Back-to-back -back stories by Bill Wilson, Parts 1 and Part 2 of the Prophetic Implications of the Coronavirus. And our final story, Israeli officials talk of mass shutdown, locking people in homes to halt contagion. As we examine the Bible, we find that there are approximately 2,500 prophecies contained within the Bible, and around 2,000 have already been fulfilled. Given that the Bible proves so reliable a document, there's every reason to expect that the remaining 500 prophecies, those slated for the time of the end, also will be fulfilled to the last letter. Who can afford to ignore these coming events, much less miss out on the immeasurable blessings offered to anyone and everyone who submits to the control of the Bible's author, God himself? Would a reasonable person take lightly God's warning of judgment for those who reject what they know to be true about Jesus and the Bible? or who reject Jesus' claim on their lives. Like everyone else, I am trying to make sense of this COVID-19 global crisis. As a biblicist, I'm always looking at events through the prism of the Bible. My thoughts have swung from 2 Samuel 14:14, 14, 14, where God says, like water is spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die, but that is not what God desires, rather he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. Is this his way of getting us away from the carnal transactions of life so that we can turn back to him? This is a global pandemic and all the world is being impacted. Believing that my Father in heaven desires good things for me and all who call upon his name, this must surely be a part of the Master's plan. Is this the preparation training we need when the second half of the tribulation period begins and money is no longer accepted? Many businesses will no longer handle cash and coins as this virus, different than other viruses, lives for an unspecified period of time on objects outside the body. I can clearly see the spiritual connection to the diabolical plans of Satan as he unleashes an army of demons who are carried from place to place in people infected but asymptomatic to spread the disease. Many have referred to COVID-19 as a plague. Revelation 6, 5 through 8 says in the final days, the world would be rocked by subsequent famines and plagues. In the United States, cases of coronavirus have crossed 800 and the death toll has risen over 20 with an even larger impact globally. Around the world, there's over 200,000 cases and over 8,000 deaths from the virus. Luke 21.11 cautions us that there will be pestilences in various places and fearful events in the final days. While we don't know if the pestilence Jesus mentions refers directly to COVID-19, is it a warning? The word pestilence comes from the Greek word loimos, which means plague, a fatal epidemic disease. Recently, there's been a wave of other biblical plagues. This has many wondering if the remaining six will strike soon. According to Jewish tradition, all the plagues that struck Egypt will reappear before the final redemption. The Bible talks about the first plague in Exodus 7.20, which says Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. Last year, there were signs of the first plague appearing with water turning to blood. There were several cases of rivers turning blood red reported in different spots around the world, according to Breaking Israel News. There were also signs of the seventh plague, hail, 
late last year with hail showing up in most unexpected locations. Some of these included Saudi Arabia, which was hit by baseball-sized hail, and Swaziland, South Africa, where the hail was so intense that it killed a herd of cows. What really caught attention was the biblical mix of fire and ice that struck in Australia as, as ice storms. The Bible addresses this in Exodus 9.22, which says, Hashem said to Moshe, the Lord said to Moses, Hold out your arm toward the sky that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, upon man and beast and all the grasses of the field in the land of Egypt. Recently, Saudi Arabia was hit with a massive infestation of bugs, specifically locusts, which is the eighth plague. While natural causes were blamed for the insect's appearance, the image of locusts were quickly connected with the plague. Exodus 10.15 speaks of the eighth plague, eighth plague, which says they covered the face of the whole land, so that the land was darkened, and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field, through all the land of Egypt. The final plague that has recently appeared is darkness. Exodus 10.21 speaks of this plague when it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, and there will be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. In August 2017, the total solar eclipse that crossed the continent United States was followed by one of the most catastrophic hurricane seasons that we've seen in our nation's history. Following this, on January 21st of last year, we experienced a lunar eclipse that passed over the country with a major biblical significance. The question still remains, what is the message? There are mandatory quarantines, and Israel has virtually closed itself off from the outside world. The last group of tourists leaves this Friday. What began in China and has now taken the world by storm is certainly a strong glimpse into the future. One world government that controls currency and commerce. With all its allure, even cryptocurrency has been severely impacted by this crisis. The recent run on staple goods like toilet paper has left our stores decimated and people are gripped by fear. Police and National Guardsmen are being deployed and the government is entertaining subsidizing all who are affected by this economic fallout from a virus that has not proven itself to be as devastating as ma many of the plagues and viruses of the past. Our schools and businesses are closed and we await the next government controlled restriction. This certainly appears to be a test run of life under strict and monitored control. Just look at the church's response. Services have been canceled and the gathering of groups of more than 10 are being prohibited. Is this the response of the community of faith? Services were canceled at the advice of the government. And I pray that leaders will get together and use this as an opportunity to turn the extraordinary amount of real estate used for services into triage centers, testing centers, storehouses, and support centers. So far, no one has been able to predict the life of this virus and its impact on daily life. Some are forecasting the end of summer into July-August time frame. Is, if, if, if this is a crisis of biblical proportion, or is this a crisis of biblical proportion, or the Chinese attempt to turn the world into a socialist economy, paving the way for the beginning of the end? None of us know, but we do know that prayer works and that the community of faith must be more diligent than ever to rise up and confront this present evil. The model given to us is Acts 2, and the needs of all were met not by the government, but by the community of faith. Ten million small gatherings of ten, praying for each other and studying together, covers one-third of the population of the United States. Maybe therein lies the answer. We have grown cold and complacent, and it's time for us to recapture the relevance and community impact that generated millions of new believers that started in the upper room and spread throughout the world. Jew and Gentile worshiping together on a personal level. This is a call to prayer and a call to never again settle for church as usual. Whatever the outcome, we are the ones that need to carry the message. If you are at home, then replace a few hours a day studying the Bible with your children. Let us rebuild at home where it was always supposed to be done and come out the other side stronger in our knowledge of the Lord. Is this a test run? We won't know for sure for some time to come, but the time is coming that we know for sure. Will you be prepared, prayed up, 
strengthen in your faith to stand up against what the Word tells us will one day come upon us. The body is so divided on whether or not we will see the day of trouble that statistically 80% are wrong. We will all find out at the same time. Regardless of the outcome, will you be ready? I think, is God, I think God is saying, on your mark, get set, and wait for the go. And that, my friends, is today's monologue. And now for today's stories. Four shocks of revelation. One day everything will be shaken by Dr. Michael Brown. It's true that the coronavirus is causing upheaval around the world. Whole countries are being quarantined. Massive sports events are being canceled. Schools are being closed. The stock markets are collapsing. But there is a mere, it's a mere tremor compared to what is coming. One day the whole earth will be shaken. As the author of Hebrews tells us, the Lord has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The word once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Hebrews 12, 26-27. Everything will be shaken on that day. This is how Jesus described it. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be seen in, in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehension of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken, from Luke 21, 25, and 26. Or in the vivid language of the book of Revelation, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everything else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Revelation 6, 15 to 17. This is how Jesus described it. There will be signs on the sun. Can you even imagine a scene like this? Very few want to talk about God's judgment today, even within the church. Preachers choose to avoid it, and the congregations cheer them on. Give us sweet stuff, give us happy stuff, tell us nice stories, make us smile. We don't want to hear about judgment. That makes God sound mean. To the contrary, that makes God sound just. He will judge unrighteousness. He will punish the wicked. He will bring retribution. That is good news for the righteous and the godly. As the psalmist said, let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Psalm 96, 13. Judgment on the wicked also means salvation for the righteous. The book of Revelation also speaks of the pouring out of seven bowls of divine wrath on the earth, resulting in horrific judgment on those who refuse to repent. See Revelation 16. There will be no vaccines or cures on that day. There will be no intervention by the federal government. There will be no way of escape other than running to the Lord for mercy and taking refuge under his wings. Judgment is certainly coming. Isaiah put it like this. Please listen slowly and prayerfully. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priests as for people, for the master as for his servant, for the mistress as for her servant, for seller as for buyer, for borrow as for lender, for debtor as for creditor, the earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languages and withers. The heavens language, langu languish with the earth. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, the, therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up, and very few are left. Isaiah 24, 1-6. Even if we understand that the prophets sometimes spoke in hy hyperbolic language, the overall meaning of these words is undeniable. One day severe judgment will fall on a guilty planet. Yet even in the midst of this terrifying description, there are words of hopes for God's people. In fact, there is divine, a divine invitation to take refuge in Him. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the wrath has passed by. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed on, our, on it, 
The earth will conceal its slain no longer. Isaiah 26, 20 and 21. As Proverbs states, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Proverbs 18 and 10. And as Psalm 91 declares, there is a place of protection, a hiding place in God Most High. That's why Jesus said this to his followers immediately after warning of the judgment that would be coming to the earth. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads before, because your redemption is drawing near. Luke 21, 28. The coming of the Lord is at hand. And that's why the very passage from Hebrews that we quoted at the beginning of this article ends with this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. The whole world will be shaken, but God's kingdom and God's people will not be shaken. As the psalmist declared, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Psalm 46, 1 through 5. And this, surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. Psalm 112, verses 6 through 8. It is true that the coronavirus has taken many lives so far, and every life is precious. And it is true that many more lives could be lost along with real suffering for hundreds of millions due to economic crises. But this is only a small blip on the radar compared to what is coming. Now would be a good time for us as God's holy people to learn to trust Him in the midst of crisis, putting our spiritual roots down deep. Now would be a good time to realize that all life is transitory and that at best we are only passing through this world. Now would be a good time to take hold afresh of the beauty of the cross and the gift of eternal life. And now would be a good time to be used as agents of mercy and hope to a hurting world. In Jesus we have all that we will ever need and in Him we will never be shaken. Our next story, Coronavirus, the Good News by Trey Goins Phillips. Have I washed my hands enough today? Am I carrying the coronavirus right now and I just don't know it? Have I crossed paths with someone who's infected? What about my job? How bad will the economy get? Life in the middle of a pandemic can be a little jarring, especially with all the negative news and uncertainty surrounding the coronavirus. While there is now and always will be plenty to be concerned about, I've quickly found out it's really important, perhaps now more than ever, to find and savor the things worth celebrating. As it turns out, not all the news is bad news. So here's a list of 13 good news stories relating to the novel, to the novel coronavirus. Number one, Wuhan. Wuhan, which was the epicenter of the COVID-19 epidemic, has closed the last of its 16 temporary coronavirus hospitals because there aren't enough patients to keep them open. Two, Dutch researchers have discovered a human antibody they believe offers potential for prevention and treatment of COVID-19. The leading researcher, Baron Jan Bosch, made clear, though it is still too soon to know when it might be workable on people. Number three, a 103-year-old woman in Wuhan has become the oldest person to beat the novel coronavirus. She recovered only six days after being admitted to the hospital. Number four, all the Apple stores in China have reopened after being closed for one month amid the height of the coronavirus outbreak in the country. Number five, the Cleveland Clinic has developed a drive-through coronavirus test that can give patients results in one day. Number six, South Korea is finally seeing a decline in the number of new cases of the novel coronavirus though it should be noted they have seen an emerging cluster in Seoul. Number seven, experts observing the heartbreaking situation in Italy are surmising that the catastrophic number of critical cases is due, at least in part, to the country's aging population. Number eight, Israeli researchers are close to announcing the development of a corona vaccine. 
However, a lengthy process of preclinical and clinical trials will have to come before it's available to the public. Number nine, over the weekend, the government of Maryland announced the first three people in the state to have confirmed cases of coronavirus have recovered. Number 10, a group of scientists in Canada have successfully isolated and grown copies of the coronavirus responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. Isolating the virus, researchers said, will help in developing vaccines and treatment regimens. Number 11, a biotech company in San Diego says it's identified a vaccine for the novel, for the novel coronavirus. Arcturus Therapeutics is working with Duke University and the National University of Singapore to develop the vaccination. Number 12, the health department in Oklahoma said the first identified patient in Tulsa, a man who had traveled to Italy, has recovered from the coronavirus. The patient had had two negative tests indicating a total recovery. Number 13, scientists are finding it may be possible to use the plasma from recently recovered coronavirus patients to treat those who have become severely ill as a effect of the COVID-19 infections. I hope these stories have been as encouraging to you as they have been to me. We will get through this pandemic. That's not to discount the suffering that will and already has come. But in the midst of such a scary and uncertain time, it's important to cling to the good stuff. In the meantime, please continue to pray for our leaders, our medical personnel, those who are suffering from COVID-19 around the world and remember to extend grace to one another because we're all learning about this at the same time. Our next story, The Daily Jot, Prophetic Implications of Coronavirus, Part 1, with Bill Wilson. China's coronavirus is a revealer of prophetic events, perhaps the type and shadow of what is to come. We have seen just how small the world is. Humanity is globally connected in this 21st century. What happens in China can, de can determine what happens in Ohio or even in, small, in a small rural community in Africa. We can see how quickly devastation, panic, economic disaster, sickness and death can occur. If it gets worse and worse, we could see how nations could rise up against nations and how famines and wars could easily develop. The tighter food and medical supplies become, the more likely the love of many shall wax cold. Neighbor could turn against neighbor, family member against family member. This is prophetic. Christ warned in Matthew 24 and Luke 22 about events leading up to his return. He said in Matthew 24, 6 through 8, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. He goes on to say that many shall be offended. There will be many false prophets that will deceive many. The love of many shall wax cold. And in verse 13 he says, Be, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In 2005, Bill Wilson documented in his book, Warshod Living Victoriously in the End Times, that in the previous 100 years, smallpox killed 300 million people, and influenza, influenza millions. In 1918, for example, a worldwide flu epidemic attacked 20% of the global population, leaving some 50 million dead. 675,000 deaths in the United States. Do you not think that those who were alive then believed the end times were upon them? Interesting that one of the three main theories of the origin of the 1918 flu is, the 1918 flu is China. In a 14-year period from 1991 to 2005, Bill Wilson documented that earthquake frequency had increased 88%. In the 90s, 165 wars and tyrannies contributed to 180 million deaths, 100 million attributed to communism. This was a 125% increase in war-related deaths over the previous century. Famine follows war. Many scaremonger preachers may be trying to say that China's coronavirus is one of the bold judgments in Revelation. It is not. Read your Bible. The bold, the bold judgments come after the beast. The Antichrist has taken control in the last three and a half years of Jacob's troubles, commonly referred to as the tribulation. We have not seen such a figure as yet. We can, however, through this virus example, see how the entire world can be impacted by a single event and how a leader might arise. Our response, first, as Christ said, do not be deceived. Second, this is an opportunity not to place blame and be anger, but to show the love of Christ to others. 
bond together, help one another, pray for one another, have empathy, do not fear. And he says, more tomorrow. And that story is next. From the Daily Job, Prophetic Implications of Coronavirus, Part 2, with Bill Wilson. There are several aspects of the China coronavirus pandemic that have prophetic underpinnings. It certainly is a type and shadow of an end-time pestilence, which could result in great famine, as prophesied by Christ in Matthew 24, 7, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Since this coronavirus has been on the radar, there have been some 33 earthquakes in California, Oklahoma, Tennessee, the Carolinas, New York, and Maine. But when we're talking about the specifics of prophecy, it's not about America, it's about Israel. We, we need to remember that. Yes, prophecy affects America and vice versa, and you and I, but it is centered on Israel and the return of Christ. Unpacking coronavirus prophetically takes a discerning heart. Let's look at when coronavirus began accelerating from its origin in China and the events that were impacting Israel at the time. My friend, White House correspondent Bill Koenig, has kept track of events facilitated by the U.S. that impact Israel for decades. In his book, Eye to AI, Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel, Bill has mapped out every recent president's attempt at dividing up Israel to foster peace in the Middle East. He has found a pattern. Within 48 hours of a president initiating a peace plan that divides Israel, a, national, a natural, economic, or political disaster hits the United States. President Trump's deal of the century is no different. When it was announced, Bill and I wondered what event would be triggered. Remember when George Bush and Arya Sharon forced Israelis from their homes in Gaza? Katrina formed up in the ocean. Bill Koenig has now documented corona begins to spread in China December 31st. Trump-China trade deal signed at White House January 15th. Trump deal of the century presented with MAP at White House January 28th. 40 minutes after President Trump posted his deal of the century map on Twitter for his 71.8 million followers, the Miami, Florida financial district was rocked with a 7.7 earthquake. On January 28th, <clears throat> the coronavirus expansion begins worldwide. January 28th, the CDC confirms first human-to-human -human transmission of coronavirus in the United States, reported by CNBC. January 31st, this is not intended to criticize the president. He's doing a good job. These are just the facts, examples of prophecy and humans interact. There are a lot of conspiracy theories, fake news, and just plain lies being circulated in cyberspace that foment fear, paranoia, and anxiety. Isn't it enough to look at this global issue from the facts? Yes, this is a prophetic event. It's showing us just how fast your freedom can be shackled. It demonstrates how quickly the world can be locked down in response to a crisis. This China coronavirus is no less than a type and shadow of things to come, and only time and events will tell if it is more than that. My advice? Watch carefully for leaders arising out of the Middle East, especially from Turkey and Iran. Study Daniel 8, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and Matthew 24. Don't get caught up in the wild-eyed claim, wild claims and conspiracy theories. They're only, they're only there to deceive. Be wise. Take care. Show the love of Christ as your testimony. Remember, you are still here, and you will be until the Lord decides to remove you. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Do not fear. Our next story from World Israel News, or is it, are Israeli officials talk of mass shutdown, locking people in homes to halt contagion. One of the first countries to take coronavirus seriously, Israel has enacted ever more draconian stricter, strictures, strictures in the past week to combat the deadly contagion. However, it's still not enough for senior members of Israel's health ministry. Ministry of Health officials are again urging the prime minister to impose a general closure and declare a state of emergency so that only infrastructure and workplaces that are defined as necessary will be allowed to operate, Yediot Aronaut reports on Monday. The senior officials say a mass quarantine is necessary in order to prevent a massive uptick in the number of cases, the report says. The Israeli health system is preparing to carry out a drill in which 1,000s become sick and the mortality rate from the disease spikes. 
As of Monday morning, 250 cases have been reported with five in serious condition. Corona is out of control, an unnamed director of a major hospital told the paper. The number of patients who are, to are only very partial because of the limited scope of the test is rising rapidly, indicating that the disease is spreading quickly in the community. There are probably thousands of patients nowadays. If this rapid spread is to be stopped, you have to quarantine the public in their own houses, the hospital director said. The paper also quotes a senior official at the health ministry who said, at the current stage of the epidemic, there's no way to avoid the necessity of a widespread shutdown, despite the great public op opposition that is anticipated by such a move. The situation in Italy and Spain is catastrophic, and other countries, including the U.S., are on the way to finding themselves in a similar crisis. At this stage, there's no more room for hesitation, the official said. The official urged that the situation be handed over to the Defense Ministry. Hard hit Italy reported 3,590 new cases and 368 deaths in just 24 hours on Sunday. The U.S., which has been slow to address the virus, has caught up fast with health officials recommending that groups of 50 or more don't get together and a government expert saying a 14-day national shutdown may be needed. The Associated Press reports Israel has been gradually upping the ante in its fight against the coronavirus. It began by ordering those returning from high-risk areas, first in Asia, to submit to self-imposed home quarantine for a two-week period. At one point in the early stages, Israel turned back a South Korean plane, which had just landed. The country had since called for all returning travelers to enter quarantine, reduce gatherings from 5,000 people to 2,000 to 100, then to 10, and to put public transportation on a reduced schedule, among other measures. Now, Israel's borders are closed. The last tourist will leave tomorrow, and then Israel will be closed. Each person confined to their home, essential services will be made available. But the tourist industry is decimated. As we approach the Passover and Easter season, and then Pentecost, we know that we're looking at billions of dollars in damages to tourism and to the economic infrastructure and backbone of Israel. Personally, our ministry is raising funds in support of Edo Kenan, our guide in Israel, who because of extenuating circumstances must be confined to his home, cannot be exposed because of a compromised immune system, and cannot work. For him and his family, his savings will run out before the quarantine will. Therefore, we have on our Facebook page a fundraiser on behalf of Ido so we can help him during this difficult time. Yes, we too will face imposed restrictions here in America. Most schools are closing. Most people are told to work from home. Gatherings of groups of 25 or less are legal as long as you are six feet apart from each other. Our beaches are closing. Our universities are sending their children home. Many are being laid off. The travel industry is decimated. Answers are not forthcoming and we have yet to really get a grip on how many are infected, how long the virus lives, and so many questions on our lips. But our trust and our faith is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And if this is a practice run for what is to come, how are you responding, in faith or in fear? How are you rising to the occasion to talk across the fence to your neighbor who you haven't spoken to in years? Now that you're at home, are you using the time to have Bible studies with your children, to talk about the Lord, to watch the teachings that are available to you at IgnitingAnation.com, to introduce your children to Bible study and to prayer, to gather together in the local neighborhood 
sitting in your front yard and in your driveway and talking to your neighbors sitting in theirs. Going back to the model of Acts chapter 2 where we shared what we had with one another, helping each other, looking out for each other. Isn't that what the church was called to do? And God's response to it was that he added to their numbers daily those being saved. You don't have to look too far out your front door to find somebody who has need, whether it's their hedges clipped or their, or their lawn mowed or a little bit of help moving something. If you have older people in your neighborhood, they certainly could use a helping hand. Take their trash can from the corner and bring it up to their front door. Pick up their newspaper for them, bring it close. Help out where you can help out and protect yourself and your family. And let your light so shine that will overcome this darkness. And we who put our trust and faith in the Lord will be saved. And that, my friends, is today's edition of Revealing Prophecy. This program, along with Revealing the Bible, are only available after they air through the Biblical Truth Library. Visit ignitingnation.com and check out the Biblical Truth Library and our guest lineup of our daily broadcast of Revealing the Truth. Follow us online through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can catch up on over 1,400 interviews and never miss any of our great guests. Look forward to the announcement of our new Roku channel, our new Apple TV channel, our new Amazon Fire channel, our new Apple apps and Android apps and new services which will be coming your way in the next couple of months. Your comments and questions are always welcome and you can use the contact form found on IgnitingNation.com. Visit our events page for information about our live events. And don't forget our regular live broadcast are Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time. Until we see you right back here for the next edition of Revealing the Truth, we thank you for watching and bless you with Shalom.